In this demonstration, we'll use the Mesh Resolution option to control how precisely the additive components are faceted in the output files. In this example, we have two NX parts. They have cylindrical and spherical round regions, which will help us see and understand the fineness of the mesh resolutions. First, let's go to the View tab and turn on the visibility of the display facets for these parts. The display facets are an approximation of the precise surfaces that's used to paint the display on the screen. So these facets are just a way to display the parts to us in the graphics region of NX. They don't mean anything to the definition of the surfaces. I'll turn off all of the edge displays. However, when we print these components, we'll send a similarly faceted representation of these parts to the printer in the output file. We have control over the faceting that's used to output our build tray contents. Each part in our tray can be assigned mesh properties using this command, either here in the navigator or using the icon in the ribbon bar. The Mesh Properties dialog will let me modify the actual STL faceting that will be used for this part when it's processed into an output file. All the instances of a part in the build tray will have the same faceting. So it's important that I point out here that this build tray actually contains two separate parts and they look the same so that we can easily compare the faceting differences in this demonstration, but they're different NX parts so that we can apply different mesh properties to them. Right now they're both set as fine, but if I change this to standard or coarse, you can see how different these mesh definitions can get. I'll leave this one at standard and say OK. I'll make a similar change to the other one. I'll increase it from fine to extra fine, maybe up to super fine or ultra fine. That's very fine. I'll bring this back down to super fine. These still display the same here in our NX graphics window, but the underlying definition now when we write the STL file is different. We can prove this by generating the actual STL file for this build tray. Then I can go to an empty part file and import the STL file to see these faceted bodies. These visually look different already, and if we go to the View tab and turn on the facet display, we really see the difference in the faceting of these parts. And these are the facets that are sent over to the printer. We saw several settings, and I want to go back quickly and show that not only can we ask for these predefined fine, extra fine, etc. resolutions, we can make a user defined resolution. With the user defined option, we have chordal deviations for edges and faces. We have angles to set between facets and overall width of facets to set. And these probably look confusing, so we can see how these are defined here in our help documentation. This is the help topic article on mesh properties in the additive manufacturing section. You see the descriptions of rough, standard, fine, etc. that we just went through. We can also look here on the right side at what these resolution tolerance numbers mean. So each of the predefined mesh resolutions has listed its actual tolerance values in this chart. You can see what those settings actually are for each option. And you can scroll down to see the definitions of each of these tolerance terms. So you see here the descriptions of the chordal deviations for the edges and faces, and then the facet angles and facet width descriptions. So we can type these values in for ourselves in the user-defined display resolution. Values like 0 0.1, 3 degrees for angle, 0.1 for width, are relatively fine. That then is how we define our mesh resolutions that are output to the print file as facets.
In this demonstration, we'll apply previously defined build strategies to our additive manufacturing project. These will define in detail how each layer of the build will be processed. We have a build tray here with a couple parts on it and some supports connecting them to the build tray. I'm just about ready to make my print file, but first I want to assign a build strategy to my project. The build strategy is a feature of the 3D printer I have selected for my build tray, and each of the 3D printers uses an associated build processor. Right now, we're using the 3MF file printer. The 3MF and STL printer choices are the initial out-of-the-box printers and do not actually use an installed build processor, so these are exceptions to what we're talking about here. And notice that the right mouse button menu for this 3MF file printer does not include the Edit Build Strategy opportunity. Once a specific machine definition has been stored and associated with an installed build processor, we can choose it as the 3D printer for our build tray. Let's switch to the large square platform metal printer, which we specifically defined based on the installed demo build processor. We can see the build tray changed size somewhat, but our parts still fit on it easily. Now the right mouse button includes the Edit Build Strategy command. When we select the Edit Build Strategy command, we see the material categories. This machine offers four material categories. We'll stick with the aluminum selection. Then there are some slicing profiles to choose. In this case, I have three different slice thicknesses available to me as profiles, probably using different laser power options. We'll choose the rough thickness. Then I have a few build strategy profiles. In this list, I find a default strategy, then one called fine small chess, and another called rough double outline. To understand why these choices are available and what they mean, we have to look at our collection of 3D printer definitions in the Build Processor Manager. The Build Processor Manager is running as a service and has an icon in the system tray on a Windows machine, and we can double-click this icon to launch it. In the Build Processor Manager, we see that there is currently just one machine under management here. We can add more machines, and if we do that, we see that the ones available to add are all based on the demo build processor that I installed. I can have five different machine configurations based on that demo build processor. I have one of these now, and I can add more of this same configuration, or I can add others from this group. For now, we'll stay with just the one to keep from getting confused. Once I have it, I can configure it. And when there are several in the list, we can configure them all individually. What I want to focus on here is the Profile Editor. We want to see where these build strategies come from. Here, under the Material Selector, we see the four materials that were available to us when we used the Edit Build Strategy command in NX. And for the aluminum material, I have some general info about how to process this material. Then, I have three slice profiles that can be used with this material. Remember, these are the choices we saw in NX. The rough 0.15 thickness is the one we chose, and we can see that has a set of information associated with it. The slice thickness is given here, and I've asked for gaps to be filled up to 0.2 millimeters in size. We also have build strategies available for this material. Here we see the three strategies we had as choices in NX. The first one, default, is just the default from the build processor installation. It has a slice thickness of 0.1 millimeters, and it has information about the path generation. This is information about the laser traces that are applied to fuse each slice. The slice will be broken down into borders and fills or hatching, with several categories of fill, and one of the things we can specify is how the fills are done. And here in the default, we see a chess pattern, which would be alternating squares like a chessboard. And the default size of the squares is set here at 
100 laser strokes wide. We can compare to the settings for the fine small chess strategy. We see the thing that we changed here is the chess pattern for the various hatching categories. We reduced the size of the squares to 50 laser strokes. And we can see that in the rough double outline strategy, we see that the name double outline was chosen because we changed the number of borders to two. So the outlines are to be traced twice before they're filled. Just to see how these things can be manipulated, let's add another strategy by duplicating this third entry. Now we have a copy of the double outline strategy and we'll call this one rough triple outline small chess. We'll make this one a triple outline with three borders. Then we'll make those changes again with the chess parameters. We'll set the chess parameters to have 50 vectors per field, that's the width, and OK to change that strategy. Now when we return to NX and edit the build strategy for our build tray, we see the changes we just made. Here again is the aluminum material and the slice profile we selected previously. And now we see that there's an additional build strategy profile in our list, the triple outline strategy we just created. That is the build strategy selected for the total build tray. We can go component by component and use the same edit build strategy command. But at the component level, we don't choose the material and we don't change the slice profile. Those selections must apply to the entire build tray but at a component level, we can adjust the build strategy profile so that the traces are constructed differently per component. We'll change this first component back to the double outline strategy. So one of these components has been specifically assigned a double outline strategy, while the other is using the triple outline strategy that's applied to the whole build tray. In this demonstration, we'll generate the print file for an additive project. We have here a couple of parts on our build tray. We have the supports built, and we've selected a build strategy for the project. We can see the build strategy selection here. All that's left is to generate our print file. We use the generate print file command to write our output file to a folder. This takes a little time as the software is making all of the slices required and breaking each slice down into laser traces as determined by the build strategies we selected. We could use the similar command print to send the output file directly to the printer instead of sending to a folder. We get a message in the corner that indicates our slices are being processed and if we click it, we can watch the progress in the processing queue for our printer. When the processing is complete, we can use the explore output directory command to go directly to the folder where this file is written. We can see here that it's about 92 megabytes and is a task scheduler task file indicated by its .job file name. This is the result of the build processor specific to this machine guided by the build strategy selections established for this particular instance of this machine in our build processor manager. In this demonstration, we'll use the slice viewer to examine individual layers of a print job and see how the laser traces are sequenced to create the components. Before we look at the slice viewer, I want to recap the build strategies that are in place on this job. We selected the build strategy here. We selected the rough triple outline small chess build strategy for the entire build tray. Then for this component, we specifically selected a different build strategy, the rough double outline build strategy. And we've created the print file.
The print file is built up level by level, applying laser traces to the slices according to the instructions of the particular 3D printer and its build processor. This print file will be sent to the physical machine. Now that the print file is written for this project, we have an opportunity to view its contents using the Slice Viewer. This application now is the Slice Viewer. As it comes up, we're looking at a cross-section of all the supports meeting the build tray at the first slice. We can step up level by level with the increment arrows at the top left, or we can use the slider to move through the levels. On the horizontal slider, we see each level being built from the start. As we go, we get a count of how many vectors have been traced by the laser. This whole slice, when it's been completed, will be a little more than 4,000 vectors traced out. We can directly type in a level to jump to a specific slice. When we jump up to slice 250, we see we're starting to get into the component volume, where the material is solid. If we remember, we used two different build strategies for these two components. In the first case, we used a larger chess pattern size, where the squares are sized at 100 strokes. And we used two outline strokes. If we zoom up, we can see the chess squares. And if we zoom in farther, we'll see two strokes per outline. We can compare that with the second component, which we said would be a chest square pattern sized at 50 strokes and three outline strokes. If we zoom back out a bit, we can see both of these components together and recognize the different build strategies in use. The other thing I want to point out is that you have some display options here to see more than just the traces. We can display the jumps between strokes. We can turn on or off the border strokes or the hatching strokes or the support strokes. And we can include the direction arrows for each stroke. If we zoom up, we can see that each trace has a direction associated with it. This is the line display, but we could also display the width of the laser. If we move all the way to the last few slices in the job, we see the highest cylindrical shapes as the cross section is reducing to complete the cylinder. And what we start to notice here as the surface becomes more horizontal is that we not only see the chest pattern hatching, but we also see these parallel traces. These parallel strokes are showing us the difference between the in-skin region, which is the interior volume of the part, compared to the up-skin, which is the upward-facing outer surface of the part. The up-skin is the last layer of fused powder in a region where the next layer above it would be unfused. So we see the upskin is being built with these parallel linear strokes as the cylinder top gets finished. The last pass is entirely upskin, as we can see. Let's zoom back out and see how the laser traces fill these patterns. We use the horizontal slider again to view how the traces progress. By breaking up the fill pattern in this way, tracing every other square and coming back to fill in the remainder, we're taking the opportunity to move the heat around the part. We want to manage the heat in this way to reduce the warpage and distortion that could occur if we keep the heat too much in one place. So. This is how we examine the individual slices in our print job using the Slice Viewer.